basically in Hungary in 1953, there was an attempt to try not to leave communism, but for this country to go its own way, and to have its own form of communism. What happened was this. Um, Joseph Stalin died in 1953. And... When he died, there was a workers. There were riots in East Germany. The East Germans tried to riot it about conditions. That was very quickly put down. But by 1955, Nikita Khrushchev um, had emerged as Russia's leader, and he basically set out to try to to get rid of some of the harsher elements of Stalinism. Now he did several things. He visited Yugoslavia. He made nice with Yugoslavia again. Um, he met Western leaders. That's something Stalin wasn't prepared to do, but he tried to get talking again to Western leaders. Now, he was a big, bullish man. He had been a peasant. He wasn't particularly well educated. And so when he met a Western leader, he tended to shout a lot. But, but at least he was meeting Western leaders. Um, in February 19th, uh, 1956, he delivers something known as the secret speech uh, to the Communist Party's leadership. And, and there he attacked Stalin for the way that Stalin had executed leaders of the Communist Party. And he attacked what he called the, you know, the excesses of Stalinism. But he was basically saying, listen, the days of me shooting people in the Communist Party because the, I disagree with them are over. When you lead the Communist Party, you're going to have to find a different way of dealing with people that you disagree with. So that was a relief to a lot of senior communists. They didn't have to worry about being arrested in the middle of the night and shot and thrown into a shallow grave. And he also said, listen, we need peaceful coexistence with the West. What we really need is a way of getting along together. We don't want a war. So there's all these positive moves taking place. 1956 in Poland, there is general unrest. The people of Poland want a guy called Wladyslaw Golmulka to take over the country. And he does. And Golmulka um, was not favoured by Khrushchev. Khrushchev did not want them there. Uh, Khrushchev arrived by plane basically to tell the Communist Party off and Gulmuka basically told Khrushchev, listen, if you, if you want to try to get rid of me, I'll mobilize the Polish army and we'll fight you. Now, Gulmuka could not win that war, but Khrushchev didn't particularly want a war. Gulmuka was a communist. He was going to stay loyal to Moscow. And so Khrushchev thought, I'll count my losses. You know, fair enough. No point having embarrassing wars, you know, because I'll look to the world that the only way this that I can keep countries communist is to send them my tanks. So he backed down. Now this is important because it sends out a signal. There are two signals have gone out. There's the secret speech where Khrushchev is saying, "Listen, just because you disagree with me, I'm not going to shoot you. Okay, you can disagree with me and live. I'm nicer than Stalin." And he's also backed down. To Golmulka in Poland. And that's going to send a message to the Hungarians. In, in Hungary, they really took this message the wrong way. They thought that what they could do is change the way that communism ran in their country without getting Moscow's permission. And they thought that Khrushchev would be a pushover or that Khrushchev was a nice guy and that Khrushchev would go along with this and it was a massive mistake. Basically in October, the 23rd of October, late in October, students began taking to the speeches, to the streets, uh, demanding reforms. They wanted communism to change. They'd had enough of persecution. They'd had enough of the secret police. They'd had enough of people being executed because they disagreed with the party. Now, the guy in charge was called Rakosi, R-A-K-O-S-I, not a nice guy, a fairly brutal ruler. And eventually what happened is Rakosi realised Khrushchev isn't going to back me the way Stalin would have. The Communist Party realised we're not going to get the backing that we used to get. Khrushchev would like us to take care of our own problems without sending in Russian tanks. So they turned to a guy called Imre Naji. And Naji, N-A-G-Y. <coughs> and he was a much more moderate guy and a much more reasonable man. 
And by the 1st of November, to try and get control of these students, to try and bring them under control. And strikes were beginning to take place in, in Hungarian factories. The workers were coming around. They wanted changes. So Nagy needs to try to get control of his country again. And he says, OK, what we'll do, guys, is we'll have multi-party elections. We'll have free elections again. They'll be f- you know, free elections. And then he also said, we're going to leave the Warsaw Pact. We're not going to be in the wars. We're not going to fight for Russia anymore. We're not going to have this deal with Russia anymore. Now, 4th of November, what happened is that 6,000 Russian tanks crossed the border to put down the revolt. Um, the Hungarians really did believe that America would come to help them. That was not going to happen for several reasons. The Americans were in the middle of an election. So there was no clear leadership in the country. Secondly, Britain and France at this stage were involved in something called the Suez Canal Crisis. Britain and France had dropped paratroopers into Egypt, and America was pretty peeved with Britain and France. So America was having an election and was having a row with two of its key allies over Egypt because Britain and France were acting like bullies with a small country, Egypt, and were making the Western system look pretty bad to the world. But the third big reason was Britain and America had agreed that Eastern Europe was Russia's business, not theirs. They'd signed a deal saying, listen, whatever happens in Eastern Europe, we're not going to get involved, and they were not going to risk a third world war over Hungary. They were not going to do that. Um, The Hungarians did fight back. There was fighting in the streets, but they did not stand a chance. Um, 30,000 people died. About a quarter of a million people fled to Western Europe. Nagy hid in the Yugoslav embassy, but he was later arrested and then executed. He was replaced by a guy called Janos Kadar. Now, Janos Kadar, even though he took Moscow's side it is still viewed as something as a hero by many commun- by many Hungarians today because what Kadar was able to do was to moderate what happened next. Um, he was able to get some sort of control back to the Hungarian people. Um, he, he wasn't as brutal as he needed to be or, or the, as maybe as Khrushchev would have liked. Um, and Kadar had been faced with a choice. He, he had been told, listen, Russia's going to come in we're going to take over again. We're sending our tanks in. Now, you can be Prime Minister or not. If you want to be Prime Minister, you come in and do your best for your people. If not, we'll come in and we'll shoot you. And Qatar had basically decided for the sake of his people that he would try to get in. He would try to get the best deal possible for them under Russian control. Um, there's an unfortunate lesson again, and this is one of the things about history. People keep learning the wrong lesson. The people of Hungary looked at Poland and thought, hey, Khrushchev dealt with Gomulka. He backed down. He didn't invade. Therefore, he won't invade our country. That was the wrong message. Khrushchev didn't like Gomulka, but Gomulka was a communist. He wasn't going to, to leave the Warsaw Pact soap. He was A-OK with Gomulka staying there. What would happen years later in Czechoslovakia is that they would draw the conclusion that the reason that the Russians had invaded was because Hungary had threatened to leave the Warsaw Pact. But if you stayed in the Warsaw Pact, Russia would be okay. So years later, um, in 1968, um, a guy called uh, Anton Novotny was kicked out in Germany. Novotny was a hardline communist and he was replaced with a guy called Alexander Dubček. And, and Dubček, um, it's spelled D-U-P-C-E-K, Dubček was a moderate guy and he realised that the Russian way of doing business wasn't working. You can't have one guy sitting in Moscow telling every shopping centre in the country what they should stock. It just doesn't work because different people in different towns want to buy different items and will pay different prices for different things and he realised the whole system wasn't working and it needed to change. Um, there had been a whole series of demonstrations and, and people coming out under the streets and strikes. And people were saying, listen, we're, we're poor. Communism was meant to help poor people. It wasn't meant to keep us poor. And they could look over to the West and they could see the standard of living. The, the poor, you know, even the poor people in West Germany were living better than 
they had to live. You know, so if communism is meant to help poor people, how come we're suffering more? And how come we've got secret policemen watching us all the time and what we say? And so Dubček came in and he wanted to say, okay, we're going to have, we're going to have communism with a human face. He says, you can have communism, but it can be human, it can be nice. It doesn't have to be this brutal regime that arrests people and persecutes people. And so he says, listen, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to have less economic control. I'm going to give business managers more control over what they buy. Uh, and says, we're going to have more trade with the West. There's going to be less restrictions. I'm going to let people travel ab ab abroad. But, you know, if you want to go on holiday, you don't need my permission to leave the country, go on holiday. I'm going to pull the secret police back in. I'm going to give them less power. And we're going to have freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Uh, and this was something that was called the Prague Spring P-R-A-G-U-E, it's the capital of Czechoslovakia, and it's the Prague Spring. Um, and again, Dubček has drawn the lesson from Hungary. Guys, Russia will be okay so long as we promise not to leave the Warsaw Pact. That was a mistake. Because the issue had absolutely nothing to do with the Warsaw Pact. Russia did not need Hungarian, Romanian, um, East German soldiers. It didn't need them. It had a very big whopping army all of its own. What Russia was worried about was multi-party elections. The second that one communist country gave in and said, listen, we're going to allow different parties in communist countries. We're going to say allow a communist party and a conservative party and a labor party and a liberal democratic party. You can have different parties and we'll all compete for the same election. Well, once the Czechoslovakians allowed that, well, maybe the East Germans would allow it too. And if the East Germans allowed it, so would the Polish. And if they allowed it, then people in Russia would be crying out for it. And here's the problem. The communists could never win an election. They would get voted out. And what Dubček was doing by saying, listen, I'm going to allow different parties, I'm going to have elections, we're going to have free speech, we're going to have free press. He was basically saying, hey, listen, guys, I'm going to pull the whole communist system down. You don't mind, do you? Funnily enough, the Russians said, yes, we mind. The East Germans said, yes, we mind. The Hungarians said, yes, we mind. All the communist leaders said, no, you're not going to do this. And so a huge invasion force was assembled. And it rolled into Czechoslovakia. Um, Dubček said, we're going to have passive resistance. And so there weren't riots. There were people who tried to form human barriers in the street to stop the tanks going down. I mean, the Russians, for once, didn't drive over the top of them. But by and large, the people had to give in. Dubček was, wasn't was shot. I mean, they didn't take him away and execute him like the 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 Dunmanagi in Hungary 10 years earlier. But what they did do <clears throat> is they just sort of demoted him a little bit and they gave him less of a role in the country and then slightly less of the role in the country. And he was replaced by a guy called Gustav Husak. Uh, and, and Husak was a hardliner. Um. And so the Prague Spring was brought to an end because people had drawn the wrong conclusion. Now, th this brought in something called the Brezhnev Doctrine. Brezhnev was the, the leader of Russia, the, 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 the guy who was running the, the Communist Party after, um, after Khrushchev. And so Brezhnev has taken over. And the Brezhnev Doctrine was basically this. You're not allowed to defy Russia if you live behind the Iron, Iron Curtain. It's sometimes said that the Brezhnev Doctrine is you were not allowed to leave the Warsaw Pact. That really had nothing very much to do with it. It was part of it. But what it was basically doing is you do not do anything without Russia's permission. You don't do it. We'll tell you how to run your country or you're dealing with Russian tanks. But again, the difficulty is in drawing the wrong lesson from history. People looking at history, looking at Hungary, knowing their history well, but drawing the wrong lesson, not being careful enough, rushing to judgment. Dubček should have known better. If you try to introduce one or two of those little reforms and let it run for five or six years, particularly the economic reforms, just give managers more control, Brezhnev would not have cared. There were tanks would not have gone in, and maybe you could have allowed a little bit more freedom of the press or said, but the secret, sir, the secret police aren't going to hunt quite as many people. If he had gradually introduced reform, he had had Czechoslovakia would have been a happier place. Instead, he went too far, too fast, and as a result, 
everything he was trying to achieve was completely crushed.